God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Well, we do praise God for being in the house of prayer on this special occasion. We want to share thought with you, and we're going to ask that you consider the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. And I'm reading today from the New International Version. Just a couple of verses there. Verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Hosanna. My subject this morning, from Hosanna to Hallelujah. From Hosanna to Hallelujah. Well, obviously it is Palm Sunday, once again. Palm Sunday, as we all know, is celebrated across Christian traditions. It's the day that launches what many church traditions call Holy Week. It is the last week of our Lord Jesus Christ, and Almost half of the Gospels are dedicated to this one week. It's launched by Palm Sunday, and each day actually has a chain of events that often go overlooked or scrambled into the midst. But it brings us to that Good Friday, where we celebrate the Lord's crucifixion. And of course, it climaxes to that Easter morning Sunday, that resurrection day that changed everything. Many of us wonder why does Easter seem to switch around on the dates, unlike Christmas, which is always on December 25th, Easter kind of floats and moves around, and the reason for that is Easter happened during the Passover. And so Easter follows the Jewish Passover, and the Jewish Passover follows the new moon. So as that fluctuates, so does that date. Palm Sunday is mentioned in all four Gospels each one bringing a different component. The story that's known for Jesus riding in on a donkey. And it's often said that Jesus rides a donkey as a sign of his humility and lowliness. And that actually is not accurate because only rich people had donkeys. Important people rode donkeys. Kings rode donkeys. You notice that Jesus didn't have one. He had to borrow it. And so he borrows a donkey and goes into Jerusalem. And this fulfills an Old Testament prophecy. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. 
See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the donkey. He marches in and there's a great crowd waving palms. Now, palms was an ancient symbol of victory. We see that through paintings and sculptures. Athletes would wave palms after they won a particular bout. And so palms were a symbol of victory, conquering. Kings often minted their coins with palms, showing themselves as conquerors and victorious kings and nations. Even in the book of Revelation, when we get a glimpse into that heavenly occurrence, it says, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Victory. Palm Sunday was the closest that Israel had ever come to accepting Jesus as their Messiah. It was the closest that they had ever come to hailing him as the king of Israel. I want to look into this celebration that we know as Palm Sunday through the scriptures with maybe a fresh pair of eyes and bring out some hopefully interesting things that maybe you haven't thought about. For one, we can start that this was not the first time they wanted Jesus to be king. This was not the first time that they were ready to crown him as king and acknowledge him as the Messiah. It in fact happened once before. We find it recorded in John's Gospel, although it is mentioned in every Gospel. It's the feeding of the 5,000. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled the baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So here we see they were ready to take him and accept him as king at this point. But it becomes clear why and how this came about. When they had all had enough to eat, when Jesus has satisfied a need, that took them to a place of acceptance and ready to hail him as the Messiah. The answer to their problems. So this is not new and there's a great parallel between this event and what happens in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. In that same chapter as you go down you find that things take a change. They go south from here. Down to verse 53 Jesus said to them, Verily, truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh 
of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Well, that didn't go down well. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Further down, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. A sudden change of events. One minute, he's the next king. And in a little time after that, we don't want to be bothered with him. We are out of here. It's clear what was their motivation. Jesus speaking on another occasion. Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. That's why they were there. You see, some are grateful for what God does, but don't love God for who He is. They wanted answers to their problems. They wanted to get fixed. And as long as Jesus was willing to do that, they were on board. But when He started talking about something that they couldn't get with, they dropped them like nothing. Another thing about Palm Sunday is this is not the first time they wanted to kill Jesus. Indulge me a little bit as we rewind Jesus' ministry. Go back to the very beginning of his ministry in Luke, the third chapter. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Haley. So we're at the baptism of Jesus, the very beginning of his ministry. You turn to the very next chapter. From his baptism, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days, he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. So he's in the wilderness of temptation. Again, a story we are all familiar with. Go down a few verses. Jesus returned to Galilee. Returned from where? From the wilderness. In the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So this is his maiden sermon, if you will, in the synagogue. He expounds on this text. And take it down a few verses, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him 
to the brow of the hill on which the town was built. Why? In order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. So right from the beginning of his ministry, there were people who were ready to kill Jesus. The crucifixion wasn't just something that just dropped out of nowhere. It was a long time coming. We see it right in the beginning of his ministry. We find it in other places, early in Mark. He, Jesus, looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. The third chapter, we see the same thing in John. This is right after the feeding of the 5,000. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders, they were looking for a way to kill him. So again, this is nothing new. This was a long time in the making. When we look at this Palm Sunday, the question we need to ask ourselves is, who was in the crowd? A great crowd came from everywhere, waving palm branches. But who was it? What made up that crowd. Well, they were shouting Hosanna. Hosanna is a Jewish word, Hoshana, and it means save us. It's not a praise. It's not a call of celebration or adoration. It's not like hallelujah or glory to God. It's a prayer request. It's a plea. Save us. That's what they were saying. Hoshana or Hosanna is used one time in the Old Testament. We find it in Psalm 118. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. So these people wanted something. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with crying out to God, Hosanna. There's nothing wrong with pleading to God for help. Where else would you go? Jesus has the answers. He's the only help you'd ever need. So we should never be apologetic for crying out to God, help me, save me. Lord, I got myself into a real mess and I need you to get me out of this. I got myself jammed up and there is no way out, but I need you. So there's nothing wrong with saying Hosanna. But the people in this crowd, they heard about Jesus, but they weren't followers of Jesus. They heard about what he did, the miracles and signs that he performed. But these weren't the people that followed Jesus throughout his ministry. No, they weren't there when he said, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. They weren't around when he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Nobody was breaking out in palms when he was talking like that. And Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross 
and follow me. No palm branch is there. But why now? What happened that caused this great crowd, this great crowd to come from everywhere? Well, the Gospel of John tells us that. Jesus had just performed one of his most astounding miracles they had ever seen, that they had ever heard about. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. That's what brought the crowd out. They wanted to see Lazarus. Goes on, for on account of him, Lazarus, Many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. They liked what they heard. They said, we got to get down to Jerusalem because Jesus is in town. And he has brought somebody back from the dead. This is somebody we need to be around now. There's a lesson for all of us, saint and sinner when it comes to Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a time of challenge. It's when we ask ourselves, is Jesus the Lord of your life? Or is he just king for a day? Is he someone that you are willing to lay down your life and follow, come what may? Or are you just here for the blessing? Are you just here for what he can do for you? Is he the Lord of your life? Or is he just king for a day? Another interesting thing about Palm Sunday is that Palm Sunday was initiated by Jesus himself. He didn't just crash into this scene. He created this scene. He tells his disciples, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a cult tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. So Jesus sets this off. He's the one that says, I'm going to ride in on a donkey. And this is rather uncharacteristic of Jesus. Because Jesus was never one to bring a whole lot of attention to himself. Jesus was never the one to show up on the morning cable news network. He was never out giving interviews. He wasn't always going where the action was, where he would get noticed. In fact, go with me through the Gospel of Mark. We can look through Mark, but it's through all of the Gospels. We read things like this. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Jesus sent them away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. But go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Don't tell anybody about this. I don't need you to advertise this. Read it in the third chapter. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. 
in Mark 8, Jesus and his disciples went to the village around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them, do not tell anyone about him. Well, what's going on here? If we acknowledge you as the Messiah, shouldn't we be telling everybody? After all, this is what we've been waiting for. Why is Jesus constantly telling people, just keep it to yourself. Be thankful, praise God, but I don't need you to advertise this. How about that scene on the mountain of transfiguration, which we've been talking about over the past couple of weeks? In the ninth chapter, we read that a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So this is our characteristic of Jesus, to call attention to himself. Why did he not do this before? Why did Jesus not make himself so available and proclaim who he was? Well, John gives us some insight to the mindset of Jesus. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus didn't need anybody to boast about his powers, to talk about his healings, because that's not what his primary purpose was. Jesus didn't come to make a name for himself. So even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Beware of preachers who want to be heard but don't want to serve. Who want to talk about all of their accomplishments. Who are always talking about what they've done. What they can do. Luke tells us before this happened it was about the time for Jesus to be taken up into heaven. He turned toward Jerusalem and was sure that nothing would stop him from going. This is what happened before Palm Sunday. This was Jesus' mindset. So he did all this knowing that the crowd there they just wanted to see some action. They wanted to see somebody raised from the dead. They wanted to see someone blind have their eyes open. Someone who's crippled who would get up. And Jesus knew that that's all they wanted. But he went anyway. Because at Jerusalem was the cross. And he had a determination to get to the cross. And he couldn't let anything get in that way. So the people wanted him to bring down Rome. Set us free. Get rid of Herod. He knew that he would be betrayed and handed over. He knew that someone would deny him and say they never knew him. 
But he went anyway. He knew that they would mock him. And that same crowd that yelled, Hosanna, hail to the king, would be crying out, crucify him. But he went anyway to the cross. His mind was made up and said, this is why I came into the world. And nothing is going to stop me. Yeah, they're all here for the wrong reasons, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He didn't let what was going on around him stop him, because he knew three days later, he knew that in a matter of time, no matter what they did to him, he would get up from that grave. And when he got up from the grave, he would have the keys to hell and death. When he got up from the grave, he would proclaim, All power is now in my hands. And I'm glad that Jesus was determined to go all the way. He went to Calvary's cross. It wasn't a pleasant journey. It was discouraging to see how they would turn against him. But he went anyway. Somebody said he didn't have to do it, but I want to tell you he had to do it because no one was worthy. No one was fit to take my place. But we went to Jerusalem. He looked down the line of time and he saw me and he saw you and he said, I'll stay here until I get the job done. Aren't you glad that he heard my Hosanna? He heard my cry, but he turned it into a hallelujah. When he set me free, he heard me cry out, Lord, save me. And that's exactly what he did. He came down and washed me in his blood. He came down and broke the chains. He set me free from my sin. He turned my Hosanna into my hallelujah. And I'll praise him for what he did. I'll praise him. Thank God he turned my Hosanna into hallelujah. I see you.